fintech and financial services is pretty unique in that if you're building an investment app, if you're building um, an AI model, if you're building a personal finance tool, you need a lot of data, stock data, credit data, um, news data, whatever it might be on the back end just to like test your product or demo your product for a potential customer um, before you you even sign the first deal. Um, and those data sets can easily cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So FinTech Sandbox um, focuses on giving a leg up to early stage entrepreneurs around the world by giving them free access to data and infrastructure in order to build, test and scale their product. So trying to kind of bridge that that gap and make entrepreneurship essentially more accessible. Greetings, I'm Keith Klein, the host of the VentureFist podcast, where I interview the most fascinating people in the tech scene. This is episode 305, and today's guest is Kelly Fryer, executive director of FinTech Sandbox. FinTech Sandbox is a nonprofit that helps FinTech startups build great products. Founded in 2014, FinTech Sandbox provides critical data access and development resources to FinTech entrepreneurs around the world. It's a six-month program where startups can apply anytime as the application process is rolling and there are no deadlines to get involved. And another big piece of what makes this program so unique is that they don't take equity or fees for participation. In this episode of our podcast, we cover lots of great topics, like an overview of Boston FinTech Week, which is powered by FinTech Sandbox, and this year's event is happening from October 10th to the 13th, Kelly's background story, and how she got her career started at Bloomberg, and then later, how she got involved in the entrepreneurial ecosystem while getting her MBA at Indiana University, her experience at Techstars and being part of the team running the Barclays FinTech Accelerator, all the details on FinTech Sandbox and what makes their program unique, types of companies they are targeting, and what FinTech startups can expect by participating, fundraising for FinTech startups, and a conversation around different trends in the industry, and so much more. Okay, quick side note. Did you know that you can set up a user profile on VentureFizz? It is a feature that gives you access to personalized content, job seeker tools, and administrative features to manage your email subscriptions. To create a user profile and maximize your experience on VentureFizz, go to VentureFizz.com slash register to get started. All right, without further ado, here's my interview with Kelly. Kelly, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to, to chat with you today. Uh, so excited because uh, fintech sandbox is such like a uh, like an anchor of great activity in the startup ecosystem. So we're going to talk a lot about that. But uh, what I wanted to talk about was the exciting event that's coming up in October that is run by fintech sandbox, and that's Boston Fintech Week. So what is that all about? Because that's uh, that's another pillar of things going on in the Boston tech scene. Yes, absolutely. So Boston Fintech Week, which is presented by Fintech Sandbox, um, is now in its sixth year um, of, wow. of being hosted. It'll run this year from October 10th through the 13th. Um, and we're so excited to be back at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston um, as our home base for the conference. Um, but the conference started a few years ago with really as a grassroots event um, with our founders, just, you know, kind of hoping that, that people will show up to come around and talk about fintech um, and, you know, several hundred people showed up and over the last few years, you know, thousand people have shown up. So wow. um, we're excited <laughs> to have the event uh, in October. This year's theme is focused on infrastructure. So the theme is on the brink, building the infrastructure we need for a bold financial future. Um, and we'll be diving into revolutionary technologies and financial infrastructure. That's really kind of transforming the fintech landscape as we know it. Um, and the event will be structured with, you know, a two day ticketed conference on October 11th and 12th. And then the rest of the week, incredible community hosted events that will go on through the entire week. So October 10th to the 13th. That's awesome. So the, the two days of programming, is it like you know, a lot of panel discussions, keynotes? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So we'll have wonderful um, keynote speakers, um, panel discussions across generative AI and open banking and Fed now and real-time payments and blockchain and all of the, the fun buzzword topics that people are excited about this year. Um, and so we're excited to uh, start announcing speakers and sessions, you know, probably by the end of August, we'll have that starting to go live. And it's all in person, right? Yeah, it'll be, it'll all be in person. We might have a couple, couple virtual events for folks that want to attend on online as well. Um, but yeah, it'll be in person throughout Boston. Um, so great way to, to showcase the city and um, all of the wonderful FinTech and startup organizations that we have across the city. That's awesome. And so back in the springtime, I, I was a speaker at the TechCrunch Boston event. And it was just, uh, 
it just brought me back of just being in person again. And it was so I much know. energy at that thing where I was just like, uh, in-person events are back. And it's just great to have that ability to meet people and just listen and learn. So, uh, so if you're in the fintech industry or want to network, you definitely have to attend. So make sure you get your tickets for Boston FinTech Week because it's going to be amazing. So yes, yeah, we're excited. We had tons of energy at our event last year. And it's an, it's nice here to your point about like virtual and in person. Like we're getting a great mix of folks coming from across the US and globally to come to the event. Um, but also everybody's just so excited to to be back in person and and tons of networking and opportunities to catch up with old friends and, and meet new faces. And um, we're excited to have the event in October. That's awesome. All right, let's rewind the clock. So where did you grow up? What were you like as a child? Uh, so I am born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the suburbs of Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, as a child, that's a great question. I mean, I was an incredibly uh, creative and curious child, I'll say. So I like to try a lot of different things. I think I played every sport at some point or another. Um, my parents, God bless them, uh, let me kind of explore a lot of different and random interests and that can be from like the most you know famous story within my family is me wanting to be a chef and literally like being in the kitchen making a soup of everything from like Cheetos to paprika to like <laughs> beef stock to like just crazy ingredients and letting me explore what it was like to to be a chef and um so I think there was always that sort of curiosity and, and creativity that was uh in my brain somewhere <laughs> all right how about uh where'd you go to, to school and what'd you study yeah, I went to undergrad at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, um, and I studied accounting, um, but realized during my summer internship that like internal audit and being an accountant was not my cup of tea and I was not, that was not the path for me. Um, so ended up, uh, you know, focusing on kind of more, how can I apply that to, to other areas of business, which is how I ended up at Bloomberg right after I graduated from undergrad. Yeah. So what'd you do at Bloomberg? Yeah, I started off in their global data um, training program, so essentially a new hire program for their global data team, um, and focused for my first few years on like equity indexes, which at the time, other than like hearing the S&P 500 on the news, I probably knew literally nothing about equity indexes. Um, so it was a, a ton of learning, but interesting application. It was a lot of relationship management. So helping like our um, big bank clients and stuff understand the the data sets that were related to indexes. And then the second thing I always talk about is like, I think it taught me so much about firefighting of like, how do you deal with really urgent problems, but like, stay cool and calm and collected while while you do so. Because um, there's nothing scarier than when somebody's like, I have a $10 million trade tied to this. Uh, I need to make sure that this information is right. Can you verify it? And you're like, oh, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then you went back to uh, to get your MBA. So what, what triggered the thought of uh, going back to business school? Yeah. So going back to business school is kind of always part of the plan. I actually studied for um, the GMAT, the MBA entrance exam, um, within the first year after I graduated from undergrad, because um, the score is good for, for five or so years. So I wanted to go ahead and just get it out of the way. Um, and so going back to school was always part of the plan. And I just kind of got to a point in my career where um, I wasn't moving on to the path where I wanted to be. So it seemed like the right time. Um, and I went into MBA school knowing I wanted to work hands-on with startups in some capacity. Um, I just didn't know exactly what that was going to look like, if it was going to be venture, a corporate innovation job, going to a startup. Um, so ended up going to Indiana University's Kelly School of Business um, and spending a lot of time with their their entrepreneurship teams and um, getting to know just kind of the innovation ecosystem, which was great. And so how did you know you want to get involved with startups? I don't know. I guess it goes back to the um, kind of what were you like as a child? So again, my career exploration, I um, spent a lot of time like making up business ideas in like very detailed ways. Like I'd make floor plans and price lists of like products we would offer for various made up businesses. Um, and so I think that that um, idea of just creating something from scratch was always really interesting to me. Um, and 
didn't necessarily want to start a new business myself, but I love the idea of it. And like, how can I help others to, to start their, their idea or, you know, help get it off the ground. And, and what's the, the entrepreneurial culture at Indiana university? Like it's like you, so, so you were running the clap idea competition. So you got, you like stuck your nose right into that part of their MBA program. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, this is just generally, I think across MBA programs, a lot of folks go to get their master's to like, um, do, I think a little bit more traditional functions, whether that be like marketing or consulting or like strategic finance. Um, and so I kind of went into it with this idea of I'm doing something slightly unique and I just need to get my hands dirty into it. And like, forge my own path sort of thing, um, make my own, I think, opportunity. So I got involved with like running the Clap Idea Competition, which is this kind of university-wide um, student business startup idea, um, competition. Um, and that gave me a lot of good hands-on experience in terms of understanding some of the challenges in terms of thinking through your business idea and how do you pitch it and coaching um, startups and doing that. Um, during my MBA internship, I worked for um, a company out of Wisconsin um, called Direct Supply that actually is, focuses on senior healthcare, but they had an incredible innovation center. Um, so I was spending a lot of time with their um, kind of innovation and labs team meeting startups um, like robotics startups and um, other types of companies that were focused on, you know, technology for healthcare and for seniors, um, and just trying to get that experience that I thought I might need um, post-graduation and to figure out what I wanted to do um, once I went back into the into the working world. All right. So into the the working world, great way to yeah. put it. So, so how'd you get involved with Techstars? Because that's what you did after, you know, post-MBA, right? I did. Yeah. So um, I actually threw the clap idea competition, interestingly enough. So it's, again, one of those kind of kismet serendipitous situations. One of the judges for the competition the year I helped organize it was a managing director for Techstar Chicago. Um, he and I started chatting and he was like, this thing you're doing, organizing the competition is very similar to what program managers do for us at Techstars. Have you thought about it? They just so happen to have an opening um, in their fintech team um, back in New York in partnership with Barclays. And so I started interviewing with that and um, kind of the rest was history. So I was there for four cohorts as at Techstars. And that, so that was specific to their fintech accelerator. Yeah. So it was the the Barclays accelerator um, powered by Techstars in, in New York. So focused, you know, in partnership with Barclays, um, but focused on various aspects of, of fintech and, and enterprise tech. So you end up as a program manager. So like, what does that job entail? Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of, I think of, um, you know, a lot of the tech stars teams, at least at the time, you know, it's transformed over the last few years, but at the time, you know, you have the managing director and the program manager, program director. So I always kind of liken it to almost like CEO and COO or like um, uh, investment manager and um, the operating manager sort of thing. So program manager was focusing a lot on like the curriculum um, for the accelerator program itself. So you have, you know, the way the accelerator works is you have 10 startups that are coming in person for a three month boot camp essentially. Um, so setting up what's happening day to day, we're hosting workshops, we're hosting mentor hours. So securing folks to come in to to do those and lead those and work with our startups it was setting up the um we kind of do a recruitment tour um around the different startup and fintech hubs to find the company so setting up those plans um a lot of the sort of day-to-day -day operations of running the accelerator itself got it okay but then you moved into a director role so was that more of uh like sourcing the companies it yeah, exactly. So I did a lot more hands-on sourcing of companies, diligence in companies, really kind of diving more into um, who the team is, what, what are they building, does it make sense, is this a company that should be on our short list to get to the 10 that we'll end up investing in. Um, I also did a lot more in terms of relationship management with our mentor and investor community. Um, so um, keeping them engaged, sourcing new mentors, um, that sort of thing. So it was a wonderful experience. I learned a lot. Well, talking to past directors for different tech stars programs, I was actually like, just, I guess, surprised and obviously, and also like just uh, amazed at 
the effort that was put in to get those 10 companies. Like I thought you just open, you know, Hey, applications are open and you just kick back and, and wait. No, like, like if you want the best companies, you have to be proactive and actually yes. source the entrepreneurs, not just wait for, you know, things to come in your way. So I just thought it was like a, you know, wait for people to apply, but it wasn't that. No, that's really the, like you put it perfectly of like, there is some level of, you know, applications open and mm -hmm. companies do apply. Like the Techstars sure. brand is, is big and you get those folks that like, you know, are inbound and, and apply without any effort. And some of them, you know, you will find some diamonds in the rough sort of thing and find companies that, you know, you wouldn't have thought of that do pique your interest. And so those are great to find, but um, it is a very like proactive deal flow and, and sourcing approach to really find those, those good investments or companies that you do think are going to be the next generation. So it's a lot of um, reaching out to local communities um, and leaders in local like startup or fintech communities of like, hey, you're in um, Atlanta, hey, you're in Berlin, because we were doing global searching, you know, um, who who are you seeing in your community? Who should we be talking to? Or, you know, we're coming to your city for office hours in two weeks. We have, you know, we have time to see 20 companies who should be on our list to see them. Um, so doing a lot of proactive searching. And then, you know, as you whittle down, we've talked to a thousand companies and you're whittling it down to 10 um, it's a lot of getting to know the team and spend, spending a lot of time with the the companies that you end up selecting in the end. All right. So what, what were you, like the things that you learned from, you know, being involved with, with tech stars? Yeah. I mean, I think I learned um, one, just like some of the, the basics of um, startup funding and ecosystem dynamics and like what that looks like. I mean, at that point, um, you know, it's not like I'd been super entrenched in the startup ecosystem. So I feel like I learned just generally how does, um, how does a seed round fundamentally work or, you know, behind the scenes work, how, who are the key players within um, VC and startups and um, how does it operate? Uh, you know, and then more personally or kind of professionally, I think I learned and met a ton of wonderful people across the fintech and startup and VC ecosystems um, that I I wouldn't have met otherwise. I really credit um, John Zanoff, who's our managing director of, um, you know, putting in together a great program and um, incredible group of people and companies uh, and kind of mentoring me while I was there. All right. So what led you down the path of joining FinTech Sandbox? Yeah. Um, so again, I feel like it's always a bit of like a, a kismet situation, which is nice. It's how careers, I guess, should grow. Um, so I was starting to think about, you know, it's time for me to to leave Techstars. Um, there, you know, my managing director had left. There were just some some changes. It felt like the right moment. Uh, and Sarah Biller, who was one of our mentors in our Techstars program, um, and is also the co-founder of Fintech Sandbox, said, hey, we're looking for a new executive director or CEO of Fintech Sandbox. Um, is that something you'd be interested in? Just kind of feeling feeling it out and where I was in my in my path. And so we started talking. This is in uh, like the height of COVID, by the, by the way. <laughs> I think we first started talking about this on like March like 5th, 2020, and then the world like shut down five days later kind of thing. Um, so started, you know, slowly having conversations and then a few months later, um, decided to, to go ahead and jump on board and take the role. Yeah. Talk about a great fit. Uh, so you did kind of highlight one of the founders. So I think it's important for people to, to know more about FinTech Sandbox and like its history, like it's, it's cause it's a unique program and accelerator. It is. Yeah. So the company was started in 2014 by Sarah Biller, uh, David Jagan, um, and some other key leaders kind of in the, the Boston and just fintech ecosystem generally, and started with this notion that entrepreneurs are spending their very limited cash um, to get access to these expensive data sets that they need just in order to like build and test their products. We're not even talking about making revenue. We're just talking about getting to this first customer. Um, FinTech and financial services is pretty unique in that if you're building an investment app, if you're building um, an AI model, if you're building a personal finance tool, you need a lot of data, stock data, credit data, 
um, news data, whatever it might be on the back end, just to like test your product or demo your product for a potential customer um, before you you even sign the first deal. Um, and those data sets can easily cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So FinTech Sandbox um, focuses on giving a leg up to early stage entrepreneurs around the world by giving them free access to data and infrastructure in order to build, test, and scale their product. So trying to kind of bridge that that gap and make entrepreneurship essentially more accessible. Yeah, so your data partners, uh, like what, what would be examples of data partners? Yeah, so uh, we work with about 40 different data providers and data partners across a wide array of data sets. So, you know, you have folks like Morningstar and Moody's and FactSet um, on the financial kind of traditional market data side. You have um, MSCI and Sustainalytics and others on the ESG. You have Equifax and TransUnion with credit data, um, Associated Press. AccuWeather, Plaid, Yodley. Um, so a, a whole wide array of, of data partners. And we try to constantly think about kind of what's the next data set that fintechs are going to need. Um, where are things going? Where's the market going? And um, trying to cons constantly kind of bring on new data partners to, to fill those gaps. So before, if you're an entrepreneur starting a fintech company, you would have to think about, okay, this is the market I'm going after. I need data to start testing this idea and app, uh, app out. So you'd go direct to like an Equifax to ask for Equifax. credit data or something. And then they would charge you for access to a data set. That's exactly right. So, um, oh, okay. you know, you would figure out, okay, again, I'm building a, a credit tool. I need access to consumer data or business data. Let me go to Equifax and TransUnion to get their data sets. Um, but a lot of these data providers, I'm not saying specifically these two, but a lot of data providers, are, their main focus, obviously, is selling to big institutional um, players who can afford to spend a lot of money. Um, so a lot of them aren't focused on, okay, who are either small businesses or startups who might need our data sets um, and can't afford to pay as much, or maybe they only want it for a shorter amount of time and a little bit more of these unique situations. So now startups can come to FinTech Sandbox um, and get go through our application interview process and then get free access to our data partners for up to six months each. Which one of the big differentiators of your program is you're not taking any equity, right? This is a nonprofit. Exactly. Yes, we're a nonprofit. So the, there's no fee to the startups to apply or be a part of the program. We're not taking any equity or anything like that. Instead, we make our, you know, our revenue sources are primarily through corporate partnerships. So wonderful folks like Fidelity and F Prime Capital and Mass Mutual and EY and others who um, support us financially. And, you know, for them, they're more looking to get access to the fintech and innovation ecosystem. They want to be seen as an innovative brand. They want insights into what's going on, what's coming down the pipe. And with us, since we're looking at really the earliest stages, our, um, our data access residency tends to focus on usually companies pre-series A. Um, so, but most often it's like bootstrapped and seed stage companies. So we're really seeing what's the earliest stages of innovation, um, what's brand new companies are kind of cropping up. Um, so it's a nice vantage point for our corporate partners to get a sense of technologies coming down the pipe. The other thing that is a big differentiator is it's not like you have a cohort that's, you need to apply by, you know, September 20th, cause we're going to make decisions by X. This is a rolling apply. So if you're a startup now, you can apply. It's not like it, you have to absolutely. wait for Exactly right. So most accelerator programs, you know, they run twice a year, what what have you, um, with a set deadline. For us, we run on a rolling basis. You know, the theory is um, startups need data at any time. It can be, again, make or break for a company to say, hey, you have to wait six months to get free access to this data set. That could easily be the difference between like, making a deal or not making a deal or making a closing your fundraising round or not closing your fundraising round for some of these companies. So we run on a rolling basis um, and accept applications at, at all time and give access to data at all times. Every startup's on kind of its own journey. Um, and we're entirely virtual, um, again, since it's data access. So we work with startups um, across the U.S. and then around the world as well. And one of the things about um, other programs is there's usually the um, 
the collaboration aspects, you know, you're, you know, working with other entrepreneurs that are working on a hard to solve problems. So you're learning together. There's a lot of collaboration, camaraderie, networking. So how does FinTech Sandbox, you know, bring that piece to the equation? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely more challenging in a, in a virtual environment. I mean, again, coming from the, the tech search model, there's something about, you know, being sort of in the trenches at midnight with um, 10 other companies when you're kind of locked into, <laughs> into a giant room together. There's just that shared experience. Um, with FinTech Sandbox, you know, I think a lot of it is um, networking and knowledge share. So, you know, we try to host events exclusively for our startups so that they can meet one another, get to know one another. Um, so we do a lot of those virtually. And then when we do host um, in-person events like Boston FinTech Week or our demo days that typically happen in the spring, um, we'll oftentimes host networking receptions or private events for our startups or maybe our startups and investors or our startups and partners um, to give them an opportunity to, to meet and collaborate um, and hopefully um, find somebody who can be helpful to their, their business. Okay, so there is still like a, a like a demo day that companies can participate in. Yes. So it's a little bit different. And then in the sense of, again, since we don't have a cohort model and we onboard usually about 60 or so startups a year, it's really challenging, obviously, to showcase all of them. Um, so uh, we we showcase kind of a, a, a set of them, usually about 10 or so. This this year, we actually hosted, uh, showcased 18. Uh, so we in tried to increase so that we could uh, highlight a few more companies. And we, um, we're looking to expand our demo days, potentially do, do them more frequently because they are always so popular. And obviously it's great exposure for the companies. But we do host an annual demo day, yes. And then there's other, um, like they get access to like infrastructure, like AWS and other you know, benefits from that side too. Exactly, yep. Um, access to, to AWS has been a longtime infrastructure partner for us, um, as well as, you know, again, I think, you know, we try to focus some on uh, business development opportunities, um, getting the chance to meet our, our corporate partners, or again, we do have an extensive net, uh, investor network. Um, so just finding other ways in addition to the data, because obviously, you know, startups getting free access to the data usually for nine to 12 months is kind of typical for us. But as companies grow and mature, how can we continue to add value and help them? So um, continuing to find new programs and new opportunities for us to, to support our startups. All right. So uh, if I'm an entrepreneur and interested in the program, uh, you talked it's rolling, you know, application process. So what do you look for in terms of selecting companies that gain access and like what other tips do you have for, you know, getting selected? Sure. Yeah. So um, our application process, is very straightforward. It's much simpler than a lot of kind of other accelerator programs are. Um, you fill out an online application. We ask you about your business and your data needs and a few other things. Um, and then you go through a series of just two interviews. The first one is um, we just want to 30 minutes, we just want to get to know you and your company. So we're looking at very, I would say, kind of basic aspects of, of kind of company evaluation of, um, you know, how's your team? Are you able to talk about your product? Does your product make sense on like a very um, foundational level? Um, are you thinking about your market in a smart way? Does your market and the solution you're building make sense? Is there a need for it? Um, and then third, really most important, especially for us at FinTech Sandbox is um, what's the data need and data use case? How are the data sets that we're offering you for free going to fit into your product, going to fit into the overall kind of roadmap or milestones for your, your company? Um, and then we do a second round interview, which is a bit longer, 45 minutes. We usually ask you to do a demo of the product that you've built so far, um, or if it's something that's not able to be demoed, um, like an API or something like that, you know, walk us through a use case of how the end user is actually engaging with this and, and what scenarios they might use it in. And again, similarly, we're just looking, digging a bit deeper, um, thinking about your product roadmap, thinking about kind of product market fit, market opportunity, competitive landscape. Um, really just kind of assessing viability of, of this as, as a startup and its potential to stay in business in addition to the, the data needs. So it's right, not so you, wildly dissimilar from like the way an early stage VC might start to consider the opportunity. Right. Okay. So you mentioned it could be uh, like, you know, 60 companies go through the program a year. Um, so so what would be some examples of uh, alumni that have gone through the program? 
Oh, sure. Um, yeah, we've had some wonderful alumni go through uh, FinTech Sandbox over the last few years. Um, a few that come to mind are Novo, which is small business banking, Zero Hash in the, the crypto and blockchain space, um, Pedal Card, um, which focuses on kind of uh, financial inclusion uh, in the underbanked, similar with MochaFi is another great company, um, Clarity AI in the ESG space. Um, and then we've had companies like Open Invest, which was acquired by JP Morgan, or Kensho, which was acquired by our data partner, SP. Um, so we've had some some really wonderful companies to date. We've worked with um over 320 startups. Um, wow. We're excited by that. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. All right. So shifting the conversation here. So the fintech industry, there's a lot going on uh in so many different areas of of the industry. So yeah. <laughs> so I, since I have someone who's like has their nose deep into it, I wanted to talk to you about you know different trends that are happening. So, um, first, access to venture capital, so raising funding for startups, it's diff- it's a challenging world out there, regardless of industry, unless you know the AI world word comes up somehow, some way. So, which I know everyone's probably attaching that. Yeah, because everybody's just embedding <laughs> in it in their pitch. Yeah. <laughs> right. But separating that, like, like, what are you seeing as relates to the funding activity for fintech startups? Yeah. I mean, you're obviously seeing a funding slowdown happen broadly. Um, I mean, uh, for the most part, it's been more so at the later stages. You're starting to see now in some of the more recent data, especially as like Q2 data started to come out, um, early stage is starting to feel some of that. Um, a lot of what I'm seeing more anecdotally are like rounds are taking longer to pull together at the earlier stages. Um, and the expectations for in terms of VCs are much higher now in terms of what they expect to see from a company before they write a check, like that path to profitability or some early key metrics and indicators um, to really give them more, um, you know, help their risk um, or their con- risk concerns before they before they do write the check. So it is slowing down. I do think, you know, it's it's cyclical. It'll come come back, especially in fintech during COVID specifically. Um, you know, there was just such a massive focus on fintech um, and a lot of money was being thrown into it. And so now I think you're starting to see just generally valuations are starting to honestly go back to normal and stabilize. Um, and you're starting to see some of that money that was just a lot of excitement all at one time starting to just pull back and pull back and pull back. So I think we'll normal, we'll, we'll even out. Uh, it'll just take a, a little bit of time. We'll see where we are. You know, this time next year will be interesting. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, some of the, like the the media, it just, it frustrates me because I think it needed a correction and we're in a normal period of activity. I hate it when they compare it to last year or the year before, because those were such extraordinary years for capital right. raising that you can't compare those years to a normal pace of activity. If you're a great business, great idea, great team, great market, you're going to get funded. If you have the elements of what an investor looks for, that hopefully will provide them a return. Um, so the last couple of years, it was just, it wasn't sustainable. And, and yes. but, but they're like, oh, funding for fintech companies has dropped by, you know, some crazy X amount of percentage. And I'm just like, stop it. Like, like can I, we exactly. compare it to a normal year? So anyways, there's my rant. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. It's like, I mean, when you're benchmarking or comparing against outlier years to begin with or outlier data, yes, it will look like, oh my gosh, the, the market Terrible. is just completely, yeah, it's awful. Whatever. Nobody's going to get funded. Everybody's going out of, out of business. Um, but in some ways it's, uh, a course correction that's also happening. And, and so what's your take on, you know, the world of crypto? Cause obviously that was crazy and, you know, anything that's new and innovative, it's gonna, you know, take some time for adoption and then figuring stuff out. And maybe there's a, a dip and then there's a, you know, so there's a, a cycle. So what are your thoughts on the world of, of crypto? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, Crypto, we saw, again, similarly, when anything goes mainstream, same with like AI and chat GPT and everything, when something goes mainstream, then all of a sudden you get 
everyday consumers and people who are trying to jump into that market. So we saw obviously so much excitement for um, Bitcoin and, and other types of, of cryptocurrencies. And, you know, you see a commercial for investing in crypto left and right, which I'm sure now is you know, come back to bite all of the celebrities that were touting it. Um, but now, you know, at least from a startup perspective, I feel like um, at the early stages, I'm starting to see a really big slowdown on things related to, to crypto. I think some of that is, you know, again, really heightened. And then Bitcoin started to go down, FTX happened. Um, so it's, I think, more so going back to like discussions of blockchain and DLT. Um, and less so about like cryptocurrency specifically, but like that underlying infrastructure that's still, you know, blockchain still has a lot of application, um, even though we, I was joking with somebody this morning, like we've been talking about blockchain for the last like 10 plus years. And it's, you know, it's, it's like, we're all waiting for it to, to get that mass adoption. So maybe soon. Yeah. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Cause yeah, but I, same where it's like, yeah, blockchain has been talked about, but you do at least understand it has its use. It's just yes, you know, what, what company is going to be the breakout that kind of spider webs a bunch of other companies doing something interesting. So yeah, it has a lot of very real applications and I hope companies continue to to look at it as a, as a technology and a, an infrastructure. Okay. So outside of that, those sectors, like what are you excited about in FinTech? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's really interesting, small businesses and, and private companies, I feel like, again, during COVID, um, got a really big spotlight on them as they very much needed to, um, and then cooled a little bit. And now we're starting to see the super interesting resurgence, which I'm excited to see and always think that small businesses need more help and support and infrastructure um, around just like a general focus there. So whether that be around um, financing and like funding options between like working capital financing and receivables um, to like basic cash flow management and forecasting and how can we get some mom and pop shops out of like complicated spreadsheets um, to like very basic uh, data and like searching on small businesses. If you think about right now, it's next to impossible to find accurate information on all of the small businesses, say in Boston or in your local community. Most of it's outdated um, and or just blatantly inaccurate. And so trying to um, make it more transparent, more accurate, more easily identifiable or searchable um, to, to find a list of small businesses to reach out to or support them. It's a, a super interesting space. So I'm excited to see kind of more focus around it. All right. One other thing that happened um, a few months back now was the whole Silicon Valley Bank thing and the bank run. And one of the things that I like, I just guess I didn't really truly think about or understand was like, you know, the FTIC's insurance coverage limit, right? So it's $250,000, right? Yeah. So if you're an entrepreneur that raises $8 million Series A and you put your money in a bank, Technically, you should spread that out in $250,000 increments in different institutions, but who's going to do that or right, like, manage that? Right, like isn't that concept that? crazy? <laughs> so I'm like, why isn't the FDIC upping the limit for companies versus individuals, you know, like, and, uh, you know, obviously that what happened was just crazy, but um, I, I'm just confused as to why that's the limit. <laughs> Same. I mean, I honestly had... Um, that exact same question as soon of all as soon as all of that happened. If you think about a company that's um to your point just raised, you know, of a, a funding round, it doesn't even have to it could be one million dollars. Like it doesn't have to be a lot of money. Um, you know, there's that scenario of where do you put it? Or even if you think about a company that's 50 people, if you're talking about a two week payroll, like two hundred fifty thousand dollars to have in your bank is not that much. Like it, it's very mind boggling that the limit we have for individuals is the same as the limit we have for com companies and businesses. That shouldn't be the case, but it is, and like, we all learn that the the hard way. It's interesting that like the 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 SVB weekend, as I call it. I mean, so fascinating to see how many fintechs just kind of jumped in there or just generally like resources that were shared and disseminated so quickly. Like on the one hand, 
um, community and social media is what was the downfall and what made it happen in the first place. Um, but it's also what helped the industry stay afloat that weekend. Um, so, I mean, you might have felt this as well. I've felt so incredibly proud to be a part of um, the startup ecosystem um, during during that weekend and how quickly things were mobilized and resources were shared um, and things like that. It was quite um, impressive to, to watch. If you think about another industry, uh, that would not have happened <laughs> at that speed by any means in terms of like, how do we get out of this? How do we figure this out? There was so much problem solving happening. Yeah, that I mean, I just <laughs> heading into that weekend, I can't imagine being a founder that has money and a bank and not knowing if it was still going to be there. Uh, you know, the VCs, uh, I'm just like, like me being in the ecosystem, but I'm on the sideline, you know, doing things. Right. I'm like, I'm not, you know, funded. I'm not a VC. I'm not an LP. So <laughs> that weekend, I'm like, ooh, I hope this gets saved as far as like the bailout, because otherwise. Venture fizz may not exist if, if all these companies I mean, honestly, don't like. Yeah, I mean that's what I, I was trying to explain to you know my parents and friends and things like that of like downstream effect. If you think about yes, it's the startup community, but we're also talking about like really big technology companies and startup companies where you know there's potential for people to to not have a job come Monday and things like that. So trying to understand truly the impact that this would have had um, and the ripple effect across other industries would have been astronomical. But then there's situations where, you know, where there's chaos, there's opportunity. And I met someone when I, I mentioned I was at the TechCrunch event and uh, I met someone from Mercury and Mercury mm -hmm. is a fintech company that is actually building that layer on top of the FDIC. I'm sorry, they're building a layer on top of that problem with the uh, FDIC insurance maximum, right? So they handle all the administrative. So if your money is going out in 250,000 increments, from what I understand, they're taking care of that and handling the administrative piece where you're dealing with a single entity. They're not an actual bank, but they're handling the processing of your money. So it is FDIC insured from what I get. I could be wrong. <laughs> I'm trying to paraphrase what Mercury's doing. So hopefully I didn't <laughs> destroy what they do, but that was my understanding. So anyways, there's opportunities for companies to do something about it. So there really is. All right. So top three apps you can't live without. <laughs> um, probably super basic of like Google, Google maps and like iMessage. <laughs> I'm constantly lost. I'm constantly like trying to look things up and just staying in touch with, with friends and family. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. How about a podcast or book recommendation? I recently, it's not new, but like in terms of a podcast, but I recently started listening to the Smartless podcast, which is like Will Arnett, Sean, Sean Hayes, and Jason Bateman. And I've just been enjoying that and kind of binging through it. Uh, it's just been so much fun to listen to, even that's, I don't listen to a ton of like work or like fintech related podcasts that much. Um, so this has just been like a for fun thing while I'm working out or in the car, that kind of thing. Yeah, they're on fire. I mean, everyone talks about that podcast. They do a great job and really uh, it's definitely, yeah. I mean, it's just it's grown in popularity. All right. Outside of work, what do you like to do for fun? Uh, I've been, I mean, I've been horseback riding since I was a kid. So, I mean, you'll probably find me at the barn the majority of the time. Uh, if I'm not doing that, then I'm probably at the gym watching a movie or just like going for a walk outside. Very cool. Well, Kelly, thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through your background. Obviously, all the great work you've been up to at Fintech Sandbox. And I'm just going to plug it again. Boston Fintech Week, October 10th through the 13th. Buy your tickets, attend, be there. We're excited to see you there. Thanks so much for having me. It was wonderful to chat with you.